as per usual, we're still we're still in the book of Judges. David Fulmer come up and asked me, he says, so are we done with Samson? I said, yes, we are. And done with the judges. And it's interesting to note, I don't know about you, but I do know about my own experience in, in sitting and listening to different preachers down through the years. By and large, in the book of Judges, once they finish with Samson, it's right over to the book of Ruth. And uh, But I told David, I said, we're going <coughs> to uh, start on the last five chapters of the book of Judges, which you don't often even hear shared. So we're going we're gonna to do that. <coughs> Um, these last five chapters, just by way of introduction and for your information, these last five chapters of the book of Judges could be classified as somewhat, and the five chapters are 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21 of the book of Judges. And they can be classified as somewhat of an appendix and supplement to the history of the period of the Judges. Very much just as inspired by God the Holy Spirit as the rest of the Bible. And just the way you, you need to understand, and I think we do this, <coughs> we, we know this, that in, in the historical history of nations, whether it be the nation of Israel or others, a lot of times the stuff is not necessarily laid out chronologically. Do you, under, you understand what I mean? But the way the God the Holy Spirit has arranged it, he arranges it very logically. You got that? So, so, there's a, so we can understand the, the total const, context. And <clears throat> while the history of the events surrounding the life of the, of the and times of the 13 judges was of a was a, of and is of a chronological nature. These last five chapters in this book are not, and they are out of sequence. And again, under the inspiration of the Scripture, we can, uh, the Holy Spirit, we cannot we cannot um, um, ignore that. So they're they're out of sequence when it comes to the chronology of the first sixteen chapters. And the actual events recorded, the events that are recorded in those last five chapters actually occurred during the early period of the Judges. <clears throat> and, and today's story of a gentleman by the name of Micah, for example, took place during the time of Othniel, who we learned when we when we studied about the judges, was the first judge. And these last five chapters, uh, they don't contain any references to great leaders or national uh, oppressions from their enemies or whatever. However, and this is strictly an opinion that I have based upon my reading of these chapters and my, my study down through the years. They are of great interest these five chapters are of great interest in the study of the history of Israel because they reveal even to a more degree and a greater degree, they reveal to us the condition of the spiritual life of the Israelites during the time of the judges. We've already discovered <coughs> as, we gone through, as we've gone through the history uh, and the narrative of the, of the judges in the, in the history of Israel during that time, a period of what, 430 years, that there was this cycle, there, were, there was this, just this cycle of, of uh, disobedience and ignoring the things of God. They were delivered into slavery and bondage to the nations around them. God um, 
brought in judges or deliverers to raise them up, and then they had years of uh, prosperity, and then they went right back into their sin. And so we saw that. But we're going to see in these five chapters how the, the sins that, were, that are listed here and, and the illustrations that are given. True life illustrations, you've got to keep in mind. The things that are recorded actually happened and can serve as examples for us and show not only the, the human degradation that was caused but and, and evident, but also of the nation of Israel uh, as a whole. The, the, these five chapters <coughs> deal, and I, I want to read this just as I wrote it down. These chapters deal with the subject of spiritual apostasy. Has it affected, like I just mentioned, both individual families and the whole nation of Israel? So let's dig into it. Let's see um, what's going on here. And we, we want to start this morning with Judges chapter 17. Let's pray. Lord, um, that which is contained in these chapters as we, uh, at the closing of the book of Judges, down through the years have been kind of unfamiliar to a lot of folks. And my prayer is that we would become uh, familiar with what's here and at the same time learn from the history learn about the history of the Israelites during that time and how we can apply what they discovered and what they needed to know so we can apply it to our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Right out of the box, here in chapter 17, the first thing we see is a narrative of religious corruption, spiritual corruption. A man named Micah had stolen 1,100 shekels of silver from his mother. She, in turn, had cursed the thief, not knowing that it was her own son. And this was common practice. If, if there was a crime committed against you or whatever, <coughs> you just, may they be cursed. May they be cursed. Or like we would say, I hope they get what's coming to them. And so that was kind of the situation. And apparently, the son feared the results of the curse, so he returned the silver to her. And then mom lifted the curse and then blessed her son for returning the silver. Good boy. Good boy. And so then she could use it for its intended purpose and we got a note, or but, it was her intended purpose and not God's intended purpose. You got that? She took 200 shekels of the 1,100 shekels, and she had a silversmith make two idols. One was a carved image, probably a wooden image that was overlaid with silver, and then the other was made probably entirely of silver. And the idols were placed in the house of her son Micah. So let's follow along as I read these first four verses of chapter 7, or chapter 17. And, and we'll see the, uh, the scriptural um, content here, the scriptural narrative of what I've just shared. Now there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from you, on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, Here's the silver with me. I took it. And his mother said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my son. So when he had returned the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son. And we mention the word holy, and it's ho holy, and not holy, 
as holy is the Lord, but all of it, W-H-O-L-L-Y. You got that? And uh, she said, I dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son. Not true. To make a carved image and a molded image, now therefore I will return it to you. Thus he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith. And the silversmith made it into a carved image and a molded image. And they were in the house of Micah. Now, this mother and son at this point was a very spiritually and morally, they were very spiritually and morally corrupt and confused, to say the least. Now, as I look through here, and as I've looked through this uh, over the years, we discover that they managed to break nearly all of the Ten Commandments. Micah broke the First and Second Commandments by having a shrine of false gods in his house. And if you want to hold your finger on the uh, on, uh, 17th chapter of Judges and refer back to Exodus chapter 20. This is where we have the Ten Commandments has given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And the first and second commandments are this. You shall have no other gods before me or in place of me. And then the second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Any likeness of anything that is heaven is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or is, or is that, or that is in the water under the earth. You got that? So he, by doing what he did, he broke the first and second commandments as we've just mentioned. And then he broke the fifth and eighth commandments by number one, not honoring his mom, and then number two, stealing the silver from her. Okay? Notice back in Exodus chapter 12, or 20, verse 12, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may, may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So he didn't honor his mom. He stole from her, and thus violated the commandment that says, you shall not what? Steal. Okay? And then he broke the tenth commandment by coveting the silver. Exodus chapter 12, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey. And here's what applies to this situation. Nor anything that is in your neighbor's house or possession. And so he, he violated that tenth commandment. And he may have broken the ninth commandment, which says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. He may have violated that commitment by lying about the fact that he'd stolen the stuff. So you got that? So he, he, and they, he violated a pile of the, of the Ten Commandments. Now, Micah, who had a shrine. Well, first let me ask you, any questions or comments on those first four verses? Okay. Now, Micah, who had a shrine in his house. So what's a shrine? What's a shrine, Pastor? It's a place of uh, dedication, uh, adoration, and many would say worship. Yeah. You get that? Dedication, adoration, place of dedication, adoration, and a lot of times a place to worship. There's shrines that are set up all over, all over the country, all over this country, and in a lot of countries. Middle East, uh, Asian countries are notorious for it. Shrines all over the place. And Micah, who had a shrine in his own house, decided, now catch this, to set up a priesthood for his family. So he made a priestly garment, 
and consecrated one of his sons to be a priest. Verse 5 of chapter 17. The man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod, or a priestly garment, and, a ho and household idols. And he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. And, and so, uh, ooh. This, of course, was contrary to God's law. Anybody tell me why? Why do you think this was a, a uh, violation or contrary to God's law? Especially, it says, the man Micah, who was an Ephraimite, remember it said that up in verse 1 of chapter 17, uh, he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. What was wrong with that according to the law? He wasn't a Levite. Okay? He wasn't of the tribe of Levi. Micah was of the tribe of Ephraim. Okay? So, he violated that. In fact, the whole procedure was contrary to what God had instructed. Now, let me give you a little stuff here. We know this because <coughs> of our study of the book of Exodus, that there was to be one sanctuary for all the people, which was what? What was the sanctuary? The, the tabernacle. Ten of meeting, and then later on, the temple that would be constructed. And, and uh, that tent of meeting was now situated quite a ways away from here in a place called Shiloh. All right? And this had been the only focus for acceptable worship of God since Israel had come out of Egypt was the tabernacle or the tent of meeting like I said, which is now at, 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 uh, at Shiloh. And here alone, in, in this tent of meeting, in this tabernacle, was the Ark of the Covenant with its tablets of the law, symbolic of the presence of God, remember, as we studied among presence of God among his people. And so the principal focus of the nation's unity, spiritual unity before God. And it was in that place alone Keep in mind, in that place alone, that uh, proper worship of God be carried out, as he had dictated by the priests whom he had appointed, priests from the tribe of Levi. See? And they would, if you wanted to worship, if you wanted to worship God, you could, in comparison, you could get together and go to Shiloh and have a convocation, either as a family or whatever, and worship God. See, worship God. And uh, they could also worship him in their heart and spirit and truth. But their main focus needed to be on the fact that they were worship, worshiping God Almighty, and, and they were putting themselves in the presence of God. All right? And so we need to understand that. But as far as corporate worship, if you were going to set up a place of worship, you can do that. You know, like the way um, Micah was doing it. Now, any questions or comments? Now, take a look at verse 6. We're going to find this verse mentioned a couple other times in, in these five chapters. And it's, and it's the last verse of the book of Judges. Because the last book, the last verse of the book of Judges says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And it says it here. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. All right? And when we do not exalt, E-X-A-L-T, 
when we do not exalt God Almighty as the king of our lives, then what takes place? We do that which was right in our own eyes. Got that? And we can't do that. We can't do that. We got to do what's right in God's eyes. And it is not, let me tell you something, that is not easy to do. Anybody who would ever tell you serving God is easy, like we say at the mission, you're so full of it. They're so full of it. It's not easy. It is not easy. And, and it takes, you know, the scripture, when it, when it comes to getting in the word, we cannot just do a casual reading of the word of God and expect to, for God to just really reach out to us and guide our lives. Got that? That's why the scripture says, study to show yourselves approved unto God. And that word study simply means give all diligence. Just dig in. Dig in. And, so, and, and we do that here. I'm so thankful for this church. And at 75 years old, this may be the last church I'll ever go to in this life. But I'm glad it is. I'm glad to, to just go out and, and as I'm being transported out of this life, say, man, I, the last church was the best. See? The ministry that I'm involved in, even though I just dearly love the ministry I'm involved in here, but the ministry at the mission, gosh, what a ministry that I never ever thought I'd be a part of, especially at this age. And I've told the guys, I told the guys this last week, I says, gosh, if this is the last ministry of this type that I'm ever involved on this earth, what a ministry. What a ministry, see. And so we just dig in and say, Lord, I just want to give my all to you. I just want to give my all to you. All right. And a lot of times, Paul, in, in, as far as uh, principle and by application, it could be said of the teachings of Paul in a lot of areas. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. And a lot of times, the finishing is, is so much more important than the starting. Okay, we get guys who start the program, 12-month program. But we get a we get forty percent of them who don't complete it. See, and uh, and and so one of the guys testified here at graduation sometime at a graduation at his graduation several months ago. He says, "I finally finished something in my life," and he was fifty-five years old. Huh? Yeah. He says, I finally finished something in my life. See? And I encourage the guys, especially the guys who, uh, that I know have hard, had a hard time finishing stuff. Keep, Paul says, fight the good fight. Run the race. See? Hmm. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It was so much more convenient. Catch this now. It was so much more to stay at home, and it was so much more convenient. It was so much easier not to have to cope with the long journeys to Shiloh for the festivals not to have to bother with the expensive business of providing animal sacrifice without blemish. And that was a job. 
If you really wanted to serve the Lord and wanted to concentrate and look forward to that time when you got together to celebrate the Passover, you had to pick out a, a, a lamb very early and you had to, to set that lamb aside and nourish it and make sure there was no blemish on it. You got me here? You understand what I'm saying? And by way of application, sometimes, and I'm thankful that it's not you folks that are sitting right here. Sometimes it's much more convenient to stay at home on Sunday morning. Sometimes it's a lot easier not to have to, to cope with the 10 minute drive to church or the 45 minute drive to church. Are you with me here? Getting kind of personal, but let's put it right where it is. And, and we've, we've experienced stuff like this in our lives. Okay? And uh, instead of making the, the long, with them, making the long journey to, to Shiloh. And it was so much handier to have a residential priest to pray for you. So Micah made his own shrine and said, set one of his own sons in the, up in the business of being a priest. Mm. And catch this now. Micah was so determined to worship God in the way he wanted the way he wanted to. And because Micah's heart was not right with God, catch this now, his so-called worship was an empty fake. We hear a lot these days in the news about fake news. And let me tell you something. Amongst the people of God around the world, there is a lot of fake worship. Okay? I've seen it. I've heard about it. Every week. Every week. You know, late at night, when it's quiet in the house, Nancy's gone to bed, I turn the TV on, or I'll switch the channel from the ball game, and I'll switch it to YouTube. And I'll go in and I'll do a, a search church services, worship services, different preachers that I know. And I spend sometimes the next couple hours watching and listening to different worship services that are happening. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of fake worship out there. Fake worship, you know. And, and uh, pastors talked about it. You know, a lot of show. There's a lot of show but not a lot of go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'm supposed to be teaching, but I'm going to preach, and so I better get back to it. Hmm. And because Micah's heart was not right with God, his so-called worship was, an, was, was just an empty fake. And doubtless, and here's the, here's the sad thing, he was pleased with it all. as it was all on his terms. I know it must be the will of the Lord because it seems so right to me. That's our philosophy. Gosh, it just seems right. It seems right. It's the mark of the idolater to presume that he, if he is pleased with it, then his God, whomever that God might be, or whatever that God might be, is also pleased with it. But actually, what Micah was doing was an abomination in God's eyes. I'm, 
I'm just giving a little commentary on the fact that of verse eight, 6 of chapter 17, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And, and then the fact of, of grabbing uh, his son and setting him up as a priest and everything like that. It's an abomination. Fake worship, an abomination. All that he had succeeded in doing was to mirror, catch this now, the pagan culture all around him. All around him. They, the plight of Israel, especially uh, when, we, when we go down the road here and the Israelites ask for a king, You remember, those of you who have studied your Bible and studied about this, why did Israel want a king? To be like all the other nations. See? And sometimes we say, I want to worship this way because everybody else is worshiping this way. The hardest thing to do, and this comes from the, the church planting people, planting P-L-A-N-T-I-N-G. The, the church planting people just from the Southern Baptist Convention. Doesn't take in, I'm not commenting on the other denominations and a, and a similar planting strategy. But just coming from the church planting people within the Southern Baptist Convention, the hardest thing to do in today's culture is to plant a good, solid, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. And that's the and the main reason is is a lot of the folks who want to do that go about it in the wrong way. Instead of instead of just getting in and say, okay, this is what our foundation is going to be. This is what this is what uh, we're going to build on. And and building it on the scripture, as contained in the book of Acts. Okay? Pastor's teaching us, Nancy and I were talking about this on our way down today. Pastor teaching the book of Acts. Brian at the mission, his class that he does a couple times a week, he's teaching the guys on the book of Acts, the way the church and church organizations need to be run. Church-related organizations need to be run. And then Nancy says, Nancy spends some good time, and I do too, listen to Calvary, Calvary Satellite Network. Pardon? Oh, yeah, our Tuesday night Bible study that Lance Anderson conducts in conjunction with his pastor, of the, being pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Fortuna. We're studying the book of Acts there. Wednesday night, the Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit's involvement in the church the way it needs to be. He needs to be. And Nancy and I both listen to Calvary Satellite Network, which is, which is the broadcasting and teaching group of Calvary Chapel Ministries. And, and a lot of their speakers, including, let's catch this now, including guys like J. Vernon McGee who have been dead for years. And they have some of his recorded messages and guess what they're on? Book of Acts. Yeah. See, so, the other day I was listening and he says, and Philip went down to Gaza. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's what's happening. Here's what's happening in the church. There are, are some folks like this church and our pastor and then hopefully me as well that are wanting to get the church back. Get the church back. almost lost my teeth. Getting the church back to a good, solid, biblical foundation. And that's hard. That's hard, see? And so, we want to mirror the pagan culture. And, and Micah was evidently becoming increasingly a part of that culture. 
And what we do when we do that, we bring God down to our level instead of allowing God to bring us up to his standard. Okay. So sometime later, a Levite who lived in Bethlehem among the people of Judah went into the hill country of Ephraim looking for a place to stay. And uh, let me, let's just read this. Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, verse 7, of the family of Judah. He was a Levite and was staying there. The man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. Emphasis on the word departed. He left the place, I think, where he should have been. Okay. Then he came to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, uh, where do you come from? Verse 9. And he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem and Judea, Judah, and I am on my way to find a place to stay. Picture Micah now. Aha! A Levite! I can have a priest! Micah said to him, Dwell with me, and be a father, and what? A priest to me. And I will give you ten shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes, and your sustenance. Again, some violation. Remember, the Levites were to be taken care of. Remember that when we talked to, we devoted a couple lessons on the tribe of Levi and the Levites themselves when we were back there in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, and, and how they were to be taken care of. How? You remember that? Pardon? You bet. From the, from the tribes. Different tribes. See? And... And so uh, Micah said, I'll pay you. I'll pay you to be my priest. So the Levite went in. Now if he would have been a true godly Levite, he should have, because they were authorized, the Levites were authorized to do this, he should have called Micah up short. You got that? He should have said, uh, nothing doing. This is not the way this works. But he didn't. Sad tale, he says, so the Levite went in. He bought into that. Then the Levite was content. Oh, here's that word content. And Micah was pleased with what he'd done. The Levite became t uh, um, content with what he was doing. So sad. He was content. To dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and he lived in the house of Micah. Okay, now. The word to describe the state of affairs in this chapter, like I mentioned earlier, is confusion. One of the words is confusion. Stolen money is used for idols. The Lord is invoked to bless the thief. Individual shrines replace worship at the tabernacle. Levites and common people are consecrated as priests. Idols are used in the worship of the Lord. But notice the last verse of this 17th chapter where Micah says, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as a priest. I know the Lord will be pleased with me because I've stayed at home from church and I've read a couple portions from the Bible and I've gone into the liquor cage or cabinet and I poured me a little bit of wine and I've had communion. Hmm. You know, folks, the sad part of this story is that Micah now thought he had the favor of God because a genuine Levitical priest was serving in his house. 
Micah practiced a false religion. He worshipped false gods with his so-called God thrown in for good measure. And all the while he rested on the false confidence that God was blessing him. However, little did he know that the day would come when his priest and his gods would be taken from him and nothing would be left of his fake religion. And we're going to see that when we look at chapter 18 next week. Read ahead. Read chapter 18 so you at least have a familiarity with what we're going to talk about next Sunday. Okay? We cannot ignore any of the scriptures. Ruthie? So he knew some of the rules and the laws that God he 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 decided did. about the Levites. You bet he did. But like myself included in this, sometimes we have a tendency just to embrace what's comfortable and right. what we like and yeah. what fits into our program yeah. instead of embracing it all. Yeah, yeah. Those of you who have been around my teaching and, and whatever for, for a lot of years know that the that the 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 way I do it is verse by verse. If I'm going through a book in the Bible, I go verse by verse. And that's the way I taught in the 20 or so years I was out at Shelter Cove. And I'll never forget one Sunday morning, I'll close with this, one Sunday morning, one of the ladies that was in, in church, she says, you know what, I love the way we do this. And I said, what do you mean? She says, I love the way we were in the book of Acts. She said, I love the way we go through a book verse by verse. And I said to her, Connie, why do you love it? And she says, because we don't and can't skip over anything. See? So, we don't skip over the stuff. We face it head on, give, like our pastor does and like I try and do, give you a background of why things were said the way they were and how it applies to this day. And, and enough said on that. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for your word. Sometimes in our lives and looking at the word, we get absolutely surprised of what's there, especially what we find there because of, you know, when, when we look at something either for the first time or look at something uh, brand new for the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or whatever time. That's been the case with me in the last few weeks as I've looked again at these last few chapters. And I trust it's the case with the folks here. Bless us, use us, and help us to give you the glory and not do the things that are right in our own eyes, but do that which is pleasing to you. And everybody said, Amen.